So we can set up a large network of nanosatellites with the necessary precision to observe these, these fractional changes in, in these light curves to see if we can find these Earth analogs. So through this nanosatellite concept, what we did is that we, organ we tried to optimize the nanosatellite survey by developing a sort of a probability distribution for the satellite based on certain parameters like how many nights we observe and then how, how much like, hours we observe in observing night. And then so we developed a probability distribution that can be generated for future light curve transit uh, surveys. But here is an example. So if we were to send a nanosatellite up to observe the same star and same Earth-like analog around Alpha Centauri B, what would be the probability that we would detect uh, one transit and two transits? So the blue line here represents uh, the probability that we will detect at least one transit around Alpha Centauri B for an Earth analog of these different periods. In addition, we have this red line here, which is what's the probability that we will detect at least two transits. So here we see, uh, we expect the probability to go down as a period uh, increases because we're only sending a satellite up there for one to two years. And in addition, we have these small dips when the satellite isn't observing, but satellites typically observe only two-thirds of the time. And then, so we can, we can create these probability distributions and then use them to optimize and pick out the best stars we want to observe. So in order to maximize our survey results, we want, to, we want to pick the planets with the highest probability of being detected. So instead of picking, instead of satellites now tend to have discrete times that they observe that are spread out over long term, we, we advise for a nanosatellite picking a contiguous block of time. So we're picking all the planets and that we aren't excluding certain planets that are caught up in lunar and solar exclusions that we periodically won't be able to observe. And so we generated a list of eight stars. These are all comparable to the sun. Some of these are known to have extrasolar planets already surrounding them. We don't know if they're Earth-like or not. And then, so these could be the starting bases for any future nanosatellite survey. So in addition, photometric precision is of critical importance if we're going to use transit light curves because that tr transit depth needs to be extremely precise in order for us to get the right measurements we need for the planet and star parameters. So we did the basic, very rudimentary framework start of, start of op starting optical considerations, and we set a very conservative signal-to-noise ratio of 14. I think uh, signal-to-noise can generally be uh, relaxed for a satellite to around 10 or even 7, but just for starters, you want to be on the safe side and set it to signal-to-noise ratio of 14, because especially for a nanosatellite, small errors on a very small scale can be amplified into very big problems. So we set the required precision. Um, to be around 6 parts per million, and we found the required number of photons to be around 2.8 times 10 to the 10th. That's a lot of photons, so what will probably end up happening for a nanosatellite is we're going to have to take, spread the image out over as many pixels as possible, and then take many exposures, and then have to bin the data together to make up for that loss in precision. So in conclusion, we address these two areas. Instead of radial velocity methods, we try to pick the light curve analysis method because we can manipulate the unique geometry and mathematically express uh, planet and star parameters. And in addition, we can uh, use a nanosatellite concept as a technological alternative to large-scale satellites we're sending up now. So these are two areas of extrasolar planet research that need to be addressed, and we do so in this presentation. So in conclusion, I would like to thank Dr. Sarah Seeger, my mentor of the MIT Institute for Astrophysics, and also the other graduate students, uh, Dr. Bryce Olivier de Marie, and then two undergraduates that also work in my lab. And then Dr. Edmund Birchinger, the head of the physics department at MIT, who's been a good source of advice. And then the Ingersoll Rand Company, uh, who has sponsored my trip here. Uh, met Dr. Ann Lai, my tutor, uh, Randy, for emotional support. And the Center for Excellence in Education and the Research Science Institute. I got them. All right, are there any questions? Yeah. How does uh, the error vary with the radius of the planets that you're trying to detect? The question is how the error varies with the radius of the planets that you're trying to detect. So you mean the error in the probability or just being able to detect it? So obviously, so for the larger the radius of the planet, there's a higher probability that they'll be detected by a satellite just because if there's a larger chance that it'll fit into their field of view. So that's the problem with current satellites now. So the smaller the planet, there's, less of a, there's more of a chance they'll miss them or the precision won't be good enough. Okay. So why is the probability of detection not monotonic? It's not monotonic. Um, the question is why the probability of detection is not monotonic. So if you go back here, 
Um, okay, so naturally we would expect it to be monotonic, theoretically. But there's two factors that come into this. First of all is that satellites normally don't observe continuously, so they sometimes like they observe for two-thirds of the time. So you can see that in dips through the curve, and also when the sun and the moon get in the way, those are called lunar and solar exclusions. And when the planet enters into these exclusion angles, that's when the probability drops completely because the satellite can't observe them until they exit this lunar exclusion time. So interestingly, we see here that both of them experience this up and down pattern until around 120 days. Then the period for two satellite, then the period for uh, and then the probability for detecting two transits for certain planets at certain periods drops to zero, but it never does here. This is because the planet has entered into this lunar and solar exclusion angle where it can't be observed completely, and then when it comes out of this lunar exclusion angle, then the period is too long that it won't go back into the satellite's orbit. So it won't be detected for a second time. So, does that answer your question? If it does, is this graph for a, a fixed viewing time, like you start Thursday and then... This is just fixed for one year, arbitrarily. We just arbitrarily for January 1st, but we expect nanosatellites to probably observe for one or two years. This is the probability of for one year. And if you picked a different start date, how would that affect the shape of these curves? It would probably just translate uh, these dips, depending on because... But the overall shape would be the same, but these probably drops to zero could be translated left or right. An observational satellite in the range of 1 to 10 kilograms has recently become feasible or at least imaginable. That's for, I suppose, for building the satellite. Mm -hmm. What can you say about actually getting it up into orbit as an acceptable cost? Good question. So right now, the question is about, um, it's now, no worries, it's sorry. now possible to make a nanosatellite, but what can you say about getting it actually up into orbit? So right now, the recent trend in satellites has actually been downsizing them. So the recently, they sent the Corot satellite up there. It doesn't quite fit the definition of a nanosatellite because it's around 30 kilograms, but the recent trend has been downsizing them to, reach, to observe like individual stars or small groups of stars. Sending them up, um, it's not, I wouldn't say it would be that much like more, there wouldn't be more considerations, but it probably, uh, it has to be, because larger satellites are less likely uh, they have more like sustenance to them, but then smaller satellites are easier to fall apart, which is what happened to the Corot satellite. So for more considerations would have to be made in making sure that everything is, like I said before, there can't be any errors because on a larger satellite where there's more factors, maybe there's more safety nets, but for smaller satellites where there's as minimal components as possible, it'd be much har it's harder to get it up into space. But then again, nanosatellites are probably going to only observe for one to two years around an individual star. So we kind of make up for it in the sense that it won't have to be up there as long. All right, that's all the time we have. Thank you.